I'd like to announce my new book, How to Be Happy, St. Thomas's Secret to a Good Life. Although just about every marketing firm, self-help guru, and man on the street has an answer, very few, if any, understand true happiness. It doesn't come from power, pleasure, popularity, or possessions. So what is happiness, and how do we find it? In How To Be Happy, I rely on the help of St. Thomas Aquinas to show what will and won't bring us happiness in this life. My hope is that by making the thought of Aquinas accessible for today, my new book will be a helpful guide to a good life. Check the link in the description of this video to get your copy today. Loser? That's okay. <laughs> G'day, Mary Healy. Lovely to have you G'day. on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, this is the first time, I think this is the first time I met you was last night at yes, the conference. Yes, that's right. Yep. And I've heard great things about you, and I've also seen some of your videos, which I found mm. really powerful. So it's an honor mm. to have you on the show. Oh, thank you. For those who to be with you. I've been long been a fan of yours. Oh, I didn't know that. Cool. Yep. I first heard your name probably six, seven years ago, and I've okay. been a fan ever since. Oh, right. So for those who don't know much about you, who are you? Well, uh, I... Um, I'm a child of God. I, I teach scripture at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just amazing that I actually get paid to be in the Word of God all day, every day. And um, I also do a lot with the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. Nice. I'm on the I'm on the chair of the Theological Commission of the International Catholic Charismatic Renewal Service in Rome. And uh, I'm a member of the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Um, and I... I love uh, speaking at conferences and retreats, I've written some books. Mm -hmm. And some commentaries too on scripture. Uh -huh. and a commentary on the Gospel of Mark and on good. Hebrews, and I'm now working on Genesis, wow, which fantastic. I'm really, really enjoying. Wonderful. Now, let's talk about charismatic stuff, because often when people hear charismatic today, I don't know, they have different, different feelings about what that might mean. Yeah. Um, some people view it as a sort of competition to the traditional way things ought to be going. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they view charismatic Catholics as sort of really kind of Protestantized Catholics. I don't mm, think this, mm, but I've heard people mm, say that. So, mm, so, so mm, what do you mean when you say maybe you're a charismatic Catholic or mm -hmm. that you're involved in the charismatic renewal? Mm -hmm. Well, as uh, all of the recent popes have said, the church is both institutional and charismatic. In fact, those two dimensions of the reality of the church are co-essential. Mm -hmm. They're both necessary to who the church is. And if you go all the way back to the New Testament, especially the letters of Paul, but really the whole New Testament, you see that the church is constitutionally charismatic in the sense of being open to the spontaneous working of the Holy Spirit yeah. when he wants, as he wants, in whom he wants, in ways that are not planned, not always predictable, but just the sovereign speaking and acting of God in his people and through his people. So the institutional is essential. In a way, it's the Holy Spirit working from above through the institutional channels established by Christ, mm -hmm. the priesthood and the sacraments. But the charismatic is the Holy Spirit working from below among all the members of the faithful, distributing gifts as he wills for building up the body and, and serving the mission of the church. That's so, cool. um, yeah, to, sometimes to those who are uh, concerned about the charismatic and think that it is a Protestant incursion into the church, I say, um, it, you know, it's too late to be concerned about the charismatic because the church was charismatic from day one, yeah, this, that, from it, Pentecost. That is what I love. I, I said this before we got on air here. I love this about my friends who have that more charismatic bent. Um, that they act and speak as if the Lord is on the move. He's working now in <laughs> our lives think? powerfully. <laughs> hey, Joseph, can you switch that light off behind you? Ready, set, quality just got way better. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, lo I love that. I love that about that people. Do, do you think that the word charismatic has become sort of problematic? I mean, Sure, absolutely, because um, in our time, the charismatic renewal appeared on the scene. The Lord, I think, raised up the charismatic renewal, poured out his Holy Spirit in a powerful way, starting right here in this area in yeah. Pittsburgh at the Ark and the Dove Retreat Center, radically changing people's lives. But the charismatic renewal, the people who are in it, have not always been known for their maturity and for their um, 
godly and humble way of sharing with others what they've received. Mm. So that has created problems. As, as every new movement of the Spirit brings with it sometimes some, some chaos and sometimes some people who don't exemplify the, the virtues, maturity of the Christian life. So that's, that's part of it. And I think also another reason that some people are resistant to the charismatic is, honestly, they're, they're nervous about letting the Holy Spirit have his way mm-hmm. and, and what that actually means to, to surrender control, mm. to let God do whatever he wants and say whatever he wants. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit messy. Yes, it um, is. When you go to a sort of prayer meeting or prayer, mm-hmm. whatever, that's mm-hmm. more charismatic. I mm-hmm. think for me, there's just like intellectual hesitancy that I'm mm-hmm. not going to sort of forfeit over my uh, reasoning mm-hmm. to some sort of weird show where people are acting ridiculous. Right, and exactly. And you've got someone up the front creating a sort of emotional mood. Yes. I'm playing devil's advocate here, right? Uh-huh, Where it's like you've uh-huh. got the lights low and maybe even a fog machine. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> oh, and and yeah. you whip people into this frenzy mm-hmm. and then people mm-hmm. naturally have an emotional experience mm-hmm. just like they mm-hmm. might at a Tony Robbins conference. Mm-hmm. It might be indistinguishable from that. Right. And then they call that feeling the Holy Spirit. Right. Well, emotionalism is of the flesh. Emotionalism is what you just said. It's artificially stirring up emotion. And that really comes from human insecurity or human desire for control and not the Holy Spirit. You know, if you have to work to stir up emotion, that's not the Holy Spirit. So we have to reject emotionalism. And certainly the charismatic renewal in some times and places has fallen into that. But much more often, and I think especially now that it, more than 50 years has passed and it's attained a certain maturity, it's, it's rather an openness to the Holy Spirit encountering human beings in all of their fragility and their woundedness and their weirdness sometimes and allowing him to act mm. and, and often touching people at a very deep level that's not just an emotional thing. You know, the Holy mm. Spirit is, is not, he's not just you know, the person of the Trinity who's about emotion. It, it's rather the Holy Spirit gives us a revelation from God the Father in Jesus Christ as to the love of God and the Lordship of Jesus that changes a person. You know, an an encounter with God in His love and His power that changes a person, that brings a person alive and is much, much deeper than emotion. And so um, being charismatic authentically is being open to that being open to the Holy Spirit doing whatever he wants. Mm. It includes emotion sometimes. Yeah, speaking out of the other side of my mouth here, I would say if this is not something to be emotional over, that you are deeply (laughs) and profoundly loved, uh, chosen, set apart, what would be? Yeah, yeah, and that that God is good to a degree beyond what you could have imagined, Mm. beyond what reason can even attain. You know, God created our reason, he loves our reason, our reason needs to be um, purified and, and, and imbued and trained in, in faith, but God himself, of course, is beyond reason, not contradictory to reason, but beyond reason. And you know, when, when somebody you know, begins to understand by the power of the Holy Spirit just how good God is, mm. How can that t- not touch them? <laughs> Let me ask you this: How do you how do you pray to the Holy Spirit, or how do you think of the Holy Spirit in prayer? Because people have relationship with the Father, because that sort of makes sense, even though that might need to be purified because of their mm-hmm. own earthly father. Jesus had a body, so we can kind of think of him as we pray. How mm. what do we do with the Holy Spirit? How do we mm-hmm. develop our relationship with the Holy Spirit? Yes, that's a great question. Well, the Holy Spirit is elusive, right? Even his name, Holy Spirit. Well, God the Father and God the Son are holy and spirit. So even his name is, is almost a, a hiding or a veiling of himself. Yeah. And it, in Scripture we see that Christ the Son reveals the Father and the Holy Spirit reveals the Son. It speaks of that in the Gospel of John. But who reveals the Holy Spirit? I would say really the answer is the church. It's us who make known the Holy Spirit. 
And so he's, he's spoken about in Scripture and in the teaching of the Church with all of these symbols, you know, light, fire, wind, water, a, a seal, the oil of anointing, all of these things. And, and none of them, of course, capture the person who is the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, but they all tell us something about his activity. Mm that it, he, he, he's a mighty wind that, that, that it blows through, sweeps away things that are of this world and of, of the flesh. And, and he's, he's a fire who burns within us and, and causes our, our hearts to burn with the love of God. And, and he's water who, who refreshes and cleanses and purifies and quenches our thirst. So he's, he's all of those things and infinitely more. Um, and as for praying, to the Holy Spirit, um, really, it's it's so simple. It's just praying, Holy Spirit, <laughs> and and the most common prayer the Church teaches us is, "Come, come, Holy Spirit, come into my life, come into my heart, come and speak to me, come and empower me, come and anoint me for whatever I'm doing right now. I, I want to do it the way God wants me to do it. I want to do it with with Your anointing, Holy Spirit, whether it's you know, evangelizing somebody on the street or, or giving a talk or, or simply having a conversation with a loved one or uh, talking to a friend who's suffering and in trouble, I think the Holy Spirit wants to be invited. Hmm. Even when you're, say, watching a football game, come Holy Spirit. I want to watch this football game in the Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to enjoy it in the presence of God, in, in love for God, in, in, in thankfulness to God. He, you know, he wants to be part of everything in our lives. Hmm. I like how you put that because I've often heard people try to describe the Holy Spirit so that he's more accessible to us, and that's probably a fine thing. But I'd never made that connection before that, well, his very name is elusive, mm -hmm. and maybe that's for a reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> how did you get involved in charismatic renewal? Or Well, it was really right here at Steubenville. Mm -hmm. When I came to Steubenville for a master's degree in theology, way back when the Earth's crust was cooling. <laughs> Seems such a long time ago. It was before Scott Hahn had come here and, oh, wow. and some of the other great, great professors here. Um, it was at the time when Dave Pavanka was a student. Wow. Who's now the wow. president of the yes. university. Um, and I came here specifically because I knew I needed God in my life. And I knew he could be found here because this campus was just alive in the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners know the story of Father Michael Scanlon. When Feel he, free to share it, though. When he first came here um, in 1974, he had been the dean before that, but uh, he came because uh, he was a TO, TOR Franciscan father, and um, his order and the Board of Trustees were, um, had basically made the decision to shut down the College of Steubenville because it was uh, losing students. It was listed as one of the top 10 party schools in the United States by Playboy magazine. That gives you an idea of what campus life was like. Mm -hmm. um, and, they, and they were going bankrupt. So uh, Father Michael Scanlon agreed to come and be president, but not to shut it down, uh, to keep it going and to bring it alive through the Holy Spirit and the grace of baptism in the Holy Spirit, which he himself had powerfully experienced in his life. And uh, he said, if you want me to be president, I, I want these uh, particular uh, uh, at levels of authority that a college president doesn't always have to make mm -hmm. decisions about faculty and things like that. And they agreed, and he came, and um, he was told when he first got here, uh, what, you need to schedule the Sunday Mass fairly late because so many students have been partying oh the night my. before that the ones who do come to Sunday Mass are only going to come if it's late. And he said, no, we're going to make it this, the same time or earlier time, and it's going to be an hour and a half, and we're going to praise and worship the Lord. Mm. And, you know, People couldn't even compute what he was doing. And he, he brought a, a number of friends with him, like Sister Anne Shields and other religious and and priests who were also filled with the Holy Spirit, and and I, he he um, the salary he gave them was something like 
ten dollars a month. He said, I can give you, you know, living quarters and food and like ten dollars a month. It was it was a ridiculous <laughs> salary he gave them. But they came and they helped to turn this whole place around. The entire spiritual atmosphere began to gradually change. By the time I came here in 1986, um, Practically all the students went to Sunday Mass. It was such an alive Mass. Most of the students went to daily Mass as well. There were so many rosary groups, and then there were household, which is like faith-sharing groups on campus, and um, students were going through Life in the, whole, Life in the Spirit seminars and um, having the Lord radically change their lives as well. Um, you know, the lines for confession went on forever, and... It was just an amazing life-transforming experience for me to be here. Mm-hmm. So you entered, uh, you did your undergrad in Notre Dame, is that right? Yes. And then you came here for your master's, and it was already alive at that point, as you say. And um, you came, you said, because you were looking for God, I think, or, mm-hmm. I'm not sure you put that, mm-hmm. but okay, so then what, what was your experience of growth in the Holy Spirit like that? I mean, were you already kind of like a Holy Spirit ninja in your <laughs> undergrad, or did you come here? No, and have an not at all, not at all. I was, I, I, I think you could say I was thirsty for the Holy Spirit, but I didn't really know where or how to find him as an undergrad. And I felt far from God. I, I, I didn't walk away from the Catholic Church, but um, campus life wasn't conducive to um, living a you know full, godly, dynamic Catholic life, at least at that time. At least I didn't find it there. So um, when I came here, there was that. And uh, after the life in the life in the spirit seminar that I took my first semester here, um, plus a healing prayer that uh, the the wonderful T O R Father who um, became my confessor did sometimes in the sacrament of reconciliation, um, the Lord just did work so powerfully in my life, and and there were several unique instances where um, the Lord just really changed my life. One was when they announced that there was going to be an all-night prayer vigil in the chapel, Christ the King Chapel, and uh, you know anybody who wanted could come and pray anytime at night or all night. And I decided I want to do that. That that's that's really cool. That that is like you know living the the life of prayer, the the life of the church to the full. Let's let's go pray all night before the Blessed Sacrament. And so I came to the chapel and. You know, starts out beautifully, and I, I prayed the rosary really slowly, and I checked my watch, and like hardly any time had passed, and uh, oh. you know, prayed some more prayers, and you know, time was going really slowly. You know, did a litany, read a little scripture, and you know, the night was still young, and I'm like, how am I going to make it through this? And uh, finally, by around two in the morning, I was getting sleepy, and I was like, this is above my spiritual pay grade. I'm not going to make it through the night here. So I left the chapel, and the moment I walked out into the cold night air, it was this absolutely tangible, perceptible experience. The Lord Jesus, whom I was adoring there in the tabernacle, lives in me. I'm his tabernacle, and and I knew his presence in such a powerful way. I knew he was there. And the emptiness that I had felt in my heart before that was gone. And it, that, that presence of the Lord has never left me since then, even though I don't always feel it. I you know, usually don't feel his presence tangibly. But yet there's a recognition he's, he's there. I'm his living tabernacle. So that was, that was a significant turning point for me. And, and then another one came when um, on spring break here, on spring break, uh, as you know, m- many American students go down to Florida to Daytona or Orlando and, and party, right, and carouse. Well, uh, Franciscan University also sent a couple of buses of students down to Florida to evangelize. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, it was called Sun Life, S-O-N. And uh, we went down there and um, we practiced evangelizing. I'd never done that in my life. We walked around on the beaches and talked to people about Jesus, and it was sometimes pretty awkward, but sometimes very moving to see how people responded. 
And uh, one time we were, one of the evenings we were there, we were in a church and we were doing praise and worship. And they were singing this song and the refrain was, he is alive, he is alive, he is alive, he is alive. And as we sang it, it's like it hit my heart. He is alive, he is alive, he's alive. And that changes everything. He really is alive. A death is defeated. The, the old life mm -hmm. is gone. The victory is won. He's here. He's, he's acting. He's present. He's powerful. Amen. So it, it was just a line in a song, but the Lord used it to just pierce my heart and, and make that truth come to life in me. So that's an example it's of lovely. not an emotional experience. Yeah. It, was, it was more a, um, not intellectual, but uh, you know, a it, revelation, yeah. a revelation to my mind and heart. Yeah, this okay. distinction between head and heart sometimes I'm not a fan of, but in some sense it makes sense. It would be like someone describing to you what a lemon tasted like. And you'd yeah, read books exactly. on what lemons exactly. taste like, and other people tell you what lemon <laughs> tastes like, and then one day you taste it. Exactly. And I, I think it was Chesterton who said, let your faith be more, well, I don't know if he said this exactly, but this is kind of my rendering, less of a syllogism, more of a love affair. Amen. And I love, that's what Amen. I love about people I, like yourself, that you inspire that in me too, yeah. I, uh, I like to use an example like that of um, the fact that, you know, one of the most cliche things y you can hear these days, unfortunately, is God loves you. Mm -hmm. God loves you. Yeah. You hear it in and the you church. Nod sagely. You, hear, yeah, yeah, yeah. you hear it in homilies. <laughs> you hear it outside the church. You hear it on you know, everywhere. God loves you. Well, it's like saying to a person who's completely colorblind, "It's green. It's green. It's green." And they can say, "Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. I get that. I can write it down. I, I can get that answer correct on the test. I know it's green." But they have no idea what you're talking about because they can't distinguish that color from any other color. Mm. So people hearing God loves you, it's like the colorblind person hearing it's green. They may totally affirm it, but they have absolutely no idea what that really means, except from the Holy Spirit. Nobody can know God loves you, except by the Holy Spirit, who's the only one who can make it real to us mm. in the very core of our being so that it changes everything about who we are, how we think of ourselves, how we think of the world, how we think of yes. life. I had a similar thought after my conversion at World Youth Day in the year 2000, I was 17, mm. and came home just like, I can't believe this is actually <laughs> real, real, you know? Mm. Um, I actually mm. thought it would be as easy as saying to my friends who didn't believe, yes, I understand, I didn't think it was true either, but it is, and that they'd be like, oh, okay, I, it was that real to me. <laughs> Uh -huh. And the analogy I could, thought of was it's like having another sense, like sight or smell or taste yeah, that had been it is. totally yeah, dormant. Yeah, and then you're yeah. like, oh, wow, like the world just opened yeah, up for me. Yeah, yeah. And, and that reminds me of another experience I had. Um, it was just after I had finished my degree here. Actually, it also happened while I was here, walking around outside and saying, the colors have, have just come to life. Mm -hmm. Everything is more colorful. It's like the world suddenly developed this new, bright, <laughs> shiny, yes. glorious um, appearance that it, it hadn't before. And I've talked to a number of people who had the I've same had that experience. Exact same thing, yeah. How, but how do you maintain your peace and confidence in the Lord when that dries up? Um, mm -hmm. And I like what you said earlier too that it's, it's this is something you have to work yourself into. That may be a sign that this is emotionalism. I've certainly had experiences where I felt like the Holy Spirit just like came out of nowhere and just started going to work on mm -hmm. me. And my mm -hmm. job was to lay back and mm -hmm. let Him do surgery. Yeah. Um, but it's living in the world with all of our defense mechanisms, with the cynicism and sarcasm with, in our mm -hmm. own heart and that mm -hmm. of others. It can be difficult to remain in that open posture. Yeah, How sure does one is. maintain Yeah, it doesn't come automatically. Yeah. Right, right. Well, um, I mean, there are many things that are crucial, basically the disciplines of the Christian life. But, um, but one thing that I have found to be really a key, um, really one of the best kept secrets of the whole Christian life, is the power of praise. Hmm. I spoke about that in, yes. in my talk. Um, and I learned it from friends and, and, and people who were um, in the community I belonged to, but particularly from a book by a guy named Merlin Carruthers, who was a, a wonderful Protestant army chaplain, 
And he wrote this book, Prison to Praise, and then another one, Power in Praise, and teaches kind of this principle that no matter what your circumstances are, even in the very worst circumstances, praise God. And not just in a perfunctory way, not just, you know, I I have to get through this because I'm supposed to, but keep praising him, not only in spite of the circumstances, but for the circumstances. Praise and thank God and keep doing it until he begins to change your heart. And I have been putting that into practice, certainly far from perfectly, far from it. But when I do, I find it's amazing. It really does change things. To praise God when things are not going well and I'm feeling off my game or whatever it might be, I praise and thank the Lord, which is an act of faith Mm. that he is God and he knows what he is doing. And he works all things to good Glory. for his purpose, for those who love him. Um, so it, it's, it's like a surrender of faith that releases God's power. It allows him to release his power into the circumstances. Yeah. And sometimes he will actually change the circumstances, and all of a sudden the, you know, the huge mountain, whatever it was, will be removed. But other times the circumstances are the same, but my heart changes because now I know God is God, and He's in control, and He knows what He's doing, and I have nothing to fear, nothing to be worried about. And in, in my weakness and poverty, His power reaches perfection. Mm, that's beautiful, and it's the, it's the perfect way to begin prayer uh, if you're sitting down to pray, telling yes. God who He is uh-huh. and telling Him who you are to Him. Sort yes, of thing. yes, right. I, I'm gonna ask you, if you don't mind, to maybe lead us in a, in a short, burst of praise here would that be okay <laughs> yeah because i know absolutely. that there are people at home who want yeah. uh, want to praise our lord they want a deeper relationship with him mm. and i think it might be helpful if if we could maybe show them what that looks like i'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, why not come, why holy not yes come holy spirit oh lord our god eternal glorious god you are worthy to be praised yes, at all times and in all places You are the unchanging God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the faithful God who never abandons us. You never abandon your children. You are always with us. And not only, oh Lord, are you with us, holding our hand through our, our most difficult times, most challenging seasons of life, Oh, Lord, but you are actually working those things to greater good for your glory and for our building up, for our strengthening, for our joy, ultimately. Lord, your goodness just goes so far beyond what we can understand or think or imagine. And Lord, even in these difficult circumstances that literally the whole world has been going through in the last year and a half, with a global pandemic and a pandemic of fear and so many restrictions, so much irrationality Mm. and so much division, so much pain, O Lord, so many people having died in in isolation and loneliness. Lord, with with all that, the heavy, heavy oppression that's on our world right now, we praise you still because you are worthy to be praised. Lord, we thank you that you are working in our lives, O Lord, according to your perfect, perfect plan, and that you are able to bring a greater good out of every single trial, out of every single struggle, all the darkness we walk through, O Lord, because we love you and because we are your children, O Lord, and you do work all things together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And so we surrender to you in trust, O Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for giving us your son, Jesus. We thank you that he's alive and powerfully at work right now, that he's the Lord over all things, that he's the Lord over this universe. He's the Lord over this country. He's the Lord over our lives individually. He's the Lord over our families. We enthrone and honor Jesus Christ as Lord as King of Kings, as Savior, as the Messiah, 
as the desire of the nations, the only one, the chosen one, O God, your beloved Son, whom you've sent to redeem us. We exalt him in your name. We, we exalt the one who has been exalted at your right hand and who reigns forever, O Lord God. And we thank you that we can experience his presence in our lives, his, his gifts, his Holy Spirit animating us, setting our hearts on fire. We thank you, O Lord, that you're right there for us in every moment and every challenge. We thank you, O Lord God, that you want to give us so much, so much more than we, we, we think or expect, O Lord. You want to um, give us an, an open heaven, Lord, that we would walk under an open heaven in constant communication with you. And Lord, we pray that that grace would be given to everyone who's listening to this podcast in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Glory what, to God. What does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus? And mm. why why is it that we don't realize just how powerful that is? <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't just mean ending your prayer with the formula, in the name of Jesus, yes. amen. And then amen's the period. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, a, and a good illustration of that is the um, seven sons of Sceva, who's a uh, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, these um, seven Jewish priests who are sons of Sceva try to cast a demon out of a man in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And what happens instead? The demon overpowers them, and they run out of the house wounded and naked. Whoa. Didn't work, <laughs> it's right? Weird. Yeah. So How did that is that, you know, Escalated. it's because the name of Jesus isn't that powerful? It's no. They were using the name of Jesus like a magic charm like a formula. They didn't know Jesus. They, they, they had no relationship with him. They were, they were just using the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches because they had heard that he's powerful. So to pray in the name of Jesus means to pray in relationship with him. It means to pray under his authority. It actually means he's praying in us. And you know, what do you think about the effectiveness of the prayers of the Son of God, mm. <laughs> who beautiful, perfectly beautiful. obeyed the Father's will? So to the degree we are praying in alignment with Jesus, and we're allowing him to direct our prayers and, and to purify our desires, to align our desires with his, and, and we're praying under his authority, we're praying in the name of Jesus. Okay. And that's very powerful. Tell us about, you, you said when you went down to Florida, you had awkward experiences as you were evangelizing people and also some powerful ones. Uh, tell us a bit of both because, uh, <laughs> okay. yeah. Um, I don't remember the awkward ones in detail. <laughs> I mean, I blocked it it's out. It's probably just going uh, up to people and it's going then walking up to people away. who are playing volleyball on the beach or whatever, <laughs> and they're like, yeah, and this, we're, yeah, we're trying to play volleyball. All these happy people start approaching you like <laughs> zombies out of the trees. They're going <laughs> right. to tell us about Jesus. Right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, but one of the other kind that I, I remember is um, it was at night, and we went up to a bus stop, and there's this guy sitting there by himself at a bus stop. Um, and we started talking to him. There were probably about three of us, just just very um, gently and you know non-confrontationally um, in any way, but just, um, you know, can we tell you about Jesus? I don't remember how we opened the conversation. But he, he said, yeah, okay, sure. And uh, we told him about what the Lord had done for us, who he was, how he's the Savior, how he cares for us. And the guy starts to cry. And he tells us, I just got out of prison today. And I didn't know where I was going to go. I, I, I don't know where I'm going to go. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do. But it's just incredible that, that you came to me today. And it was, it was a God moment. You could see that the Lord had really touched his heart. It was a, a divine appointment at exactly the right mm. time, the, the day, the hour in this man's life when the Lord wanted to touch him. So we encouraged him to connect with the church, and um, we left and, of course, never have seen him since. But I, I hope to meet him in heaven one day. And tell us also some stories that are taking place today here and now of god's healing god's continued action because that is something i think we doubt we really do we sure do we, we i think even christians we we grant it 
theoretically, of course, God's all powerful mm-hmm. and could if he wanted to, mm-hmm. but he mm-hmm. he doesn't. And we may not say that, but that's what we yeah, think. Yeah, at least he doesn't in my life. It's you know, it's okay, not going to happen yeah. in my life. Uh, it's certainly not going to happen through me. We tend right. to think. Yeah, I'm a klutz. And, uh, why would the Lord <laughs> yes, use me? Right, right. Yeah. And and that was pretty much the way I used to think, even though I was in the charismatic renewal, and a zillion times had prayed over people for healing. Um, never really saw any definite healing before my eyes you know, from praying. You know, maybe a headache feeling a little better kind of thing. Until seven years ago, the Lord very specifically led me, really pushed me to study healing in an intentional way. Um, I had a sabbatical semester at the seminary, which is time to do, you have extra time for research on a particular topic of interest. And um, leading up to that sabbatical semester, I was praying about, you know, what am I going to study? And it became really clear the Lord wanted me to study healing. And Around that same time, I went to a conference organized by Randy Clark, who's a wonderful Protestant healing evangelist, really, really godly man, humble man, and a a real ecumenical bridge builder. Went to his conference on healing, and it was a weekend of the supernatural. There were physical healings, you know, pretty big ones before our eyes. There were spiritual healings. There were conversions. There were people being radically touched by God. And there were testimonies of people at earlier conferences who had been launched into mission for the kingdom, launched into evangelization. It was, it was just it, it, the, the, the presence and activity of the Holy Spirit was so palpable. And I came away from that weekend with this deep conviction, God wants this in the Catholic Church. This is our heritage. This is what God gave us from the beginning. I mean, I'm a biblical scholar, New Testament especially, and I, I knew this is what God gave the church at the beginning, and not just for the beginning, but for her mission through all time. But I had never seen it lived out to such high voltage. And so I had that deep conviction, God wants this in the Catholic Church. This is our heritage. And I... um, I later got in touch with Randy Clark. I ended up going on a two-week mission to Brazil uh, during my sabbatical uh, with his, his group called Global Awakening. And it was two weeks of living in the supernatural. And in the meantime, I was really delving into what Scripture shows and teaches about healing, what we find in the fathers of the church, what we find in, in church history. And, and I was kind of bowled over by what I learned that that healing and the the supernatural in general is the normal Christian life. And this is true in the patristic period too? Absolutely, so so clearly. So for those who say, well, this was a special (laughs) grace that God gave the early church, which we would agree with, but that sort of ended and we shouldn't expect that anymore and didn't see that for the first several hundred years of the church. What do you say to that? They're completely wrong historically. It's, It's very easy to refute that view. It's a view called cessationism. Mm-hmm. The gift ceased, ceased, and it's uh, it's mostly certain Protestant uh, traditions yes. that hold that view of cessationism. Um, that once the New Testament was formed, the Bible was there. We didn't need the signs and wonders, healings and miracles. But that has never been the Catholic view. Yes. The Catholic Church has never taught that. And in fact, throughout the entire history of the Church, the supernatural has been much more present and evident than we tend to think. It's really in our modern post-enlightenment era that it has become much less expected. And and, and even Catholics who might be sort of skeptical of what you're saying would be okay if what you were saying was attributed to St. Pio or (laughs) St. Such and Such. Yeah, yeah, that happened there. (laughs) But no one today, it's weird. Don't don't talk like that. This is just sort of like, and I'm playing devil's advocate again, Uh like uh mass hypnosis. Like I've been to places where you've had like Mm. someone hypnotize people and they act in all sorts of strange ways. And Mm. I'm sure this praise conference you went to was very well intentioned. Mm -hmm. But um, it's more likely than not, given our own experience, a result of people being caught up in the moment, thinking they felt certain ailments leave them, 
but uh, there's 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 no hard evidence for that so I'm mm, not going to believe mm, it. Mm. I remember once seeing a, a book with the title, uh, Why Does God Do No Miracles Today? <laughs> and it was a, a very uh, devout Christian, uh, Orthodox Christian actually, explanation of why there aren't any more miracles today. And I wanted to both laugh and cry when I saw it because I, I know, and I know even more now, the, the response to that is, yes, there are. <laughs> yes, there are miracles. Now, there, there are a zillion healings. Not all of them are verifiable. You know, it can be everything from, you know, a stubbed toe feeling better to cancer disappearing. And it's showing up on the medical charts or the, or the MRI that it is gone. Um, and there are many of that type. I mean, there are, you know, limbs growing, um, Parkinson's disease disappearing and, and being confirmed by a doctor that it has disappeared. So those things can't be discounted. Now, not every miracle needs to be or, or uh, should be medically examined like the way they do at Lourdes to, um, to kind of prove indisputably there's no medical explanation for this miracle. And that has a role. You know, it, it, it helps to keep God's miracles at Lourdes from being discredited mm. and Christian faith in general from being discredited. But for most people, um, you don't need a, a, a doctor's verification to know that the debilitating condition that you have is gone, or that um, your, uh, you know, your broken limb is restored, or the tumor, well, usually with the, the tumor, you do need a doctor's verification. Mm -hmm. But there's so many cases where the healing is, is verifiable simply by the person. And it's like with the blind guy in the gospel when they're, they're interrogating him, they're asking him, you know, asking his parents, you know, is this your son? Was he born blind? How does he see now? How do you see now to this guy? And he's like, one thing I know. I love it. I was blind yeah. and now I see. Well, what are some examples that you personally have seen, if any, other than I had I had a tummy ache or I had a stubbed toe and now it feels better, which again doesn't yeah. seem terribly convincing. Or yeah, yeah. Um, one of my favorites is um, when I, I gave a talk on healing at a Catholic school, and one of the uh, teachers in the audience came up to me and said, "Would you pray over me for healing?" And actually, I thought, "Oh man, how could I give a talk on it and not pray for healing? I should have prayed for everybody." But anyway. Um, I prayed over her. There were a couple other teachers with her, with me, and um, we prayed together. She had said she was experiencing trouble breathing, maybe had pneumonia. But then when we finished praying for that, one of the other teachers said, um, how about if you get prayer for the other thing too? Hmm. And she's like, okay. She said, nobody else knows this, but a hemorrhage, like the woman mm -hmm. in the gospel. Um, it's been going on for two years. I have to take very heavy medication to control it, and it, there's a risk of stroke. It has bad side effects. And twice <clears throat> I've tried to go off the medication, and it landed me in the hospital. One time I almost died. <clears throat> and I don't even know if I'll be able to keep teaching because of this um, condition. And so um, we began to pray. I said, let's pray for that, too. And we, we began to pray, and um, I walked her through a forgiveness issue that um, the Holy Spirit kind of prompted me to ask her if there was anyone she needed to forgive. And immediately she said, yeah. And so I walked her through a prayer of forgiveness. Very often there's an obstacle to somebody receiving healing, and one of the most common obstacles is unforgiveness. Uh, holding on to some offense that has been committed against you, some resentment. So I walked her through a very sincere prayer of forgiveness, and then we prayed for healing of the hemorrhage. And then I left, and that's you know something not immediately verifiable. But 11 days later, I got an email from her on which she copied the entire faculty and staff of the school, <laughs> which is so beautiful. It's the right thing to do, to give glory to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And she recounted what happened. She said, after you, you guys left, and um, I stayed in the chapel, I was looking up at the crucifix, and she said, I felt like, as you were praying, this warm blanket had come over me, and I felt like I was healed. And I looked up at the crucifix and said, Jesus, did you heal me? And she, and she goes, I'm, I'm a science teacher. I'm not into this kind of thing. But he nodded. 
hmm. from the crucifix. And she said, I went home, I, I went off my medication, which by the way, I do not recommend. Don't go off your medication until the doctor tells you to. But she did. She said, I'm totally fine. No problem since then. And six months later, I got another email from her, totally fine Glory since to then. Glory to wow. God. I think this is what's great about you too, Dr. Healy, is as you say, like you have a PhD, you're a biblical. STD. Oh, is that, well, there's such an unfortunate name, isn't I it? I know. Um, well, you have a doctorate, uh, you're a biblical scholar, and you know that the Lord is at work. Yeah. Tell us. Uh, the, yeah, how, yeah, how sad that that would sound like a contradiction. Yeah. Why is it we're so cynical and skeptical? Is it because we've been disappointed too much? Is it because, mm. it's probably because of all these reasons. You know, is it because of the example of televangelists who are only there to make yeah, a buck? Yeah, that's bark? part of it, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. snake oil, and Fake healings. Fake mm -hmm. healings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've, I've and heard. And the power of persuasion, as, as you mentioned, sometimes it's that, you know, yep, when somebody's yep. emotions can. And, and even on in, in kind of the dark side, talking about things like tarot cards and, and palm reading, mm -hmm. you know, that there's these mm -hmm. leading questions. Mm -hmm. I get the sense that there's somebody, and you're like, well, obviously, mm -hmm. how could that not apply to anybody, you know? Yeah, right. Um, so yeah, is that is that why we're so sort of skeptical? Is it? Yeah, I think it's all of the above, and I think also because we live in a skeptical world, it's in the atmosphere, it's in the cultural and spiritual atmosphere, a mockery of faith, um, yes. a rejection of the transcendent, of of God actually intervening in the world, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Science, not science in itself, but those who claim to just be basing themselves on science see the world as a closed system, completely explainable by the laws of physics and mechanics and biology with absolutely no action of God, the creator in the world. So that's, that's all in the atmosphere that we live and breathe. Even if we've grown up in the church, we're breathing in this toxic, smog all the time of unbelief so i think that's a big part of why why people have a hard time mm. believing in in god's action in the world even the uh, olympics uh, in the opening ceremonies i believe was a, a rendition of john lennon's imagine oh, this sort of secular yeah, hymn yeah, of yeah you know, we don't need heaven we don't need god it's so sad it yeah so right sad. yeah so it's everywhere mm -hmm. What's, what's the future for the charismatic renewal? Because the last thing I want to mm. see is charismatic renewal masses. I find them just unbearable. If I, and you can disagree <laughs> with me. Push back against me if you wish. But going into a church, if I see a drum kit or a guitar, I just think, oh, God, mm. I just want to go somewhere where I, well, where, 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 where Holy Mass will be celebrated according to the Vatican II documents, at least, you know, mm. that's faithful. Mm. And mm. Somewhere where you don't have a sort of secularized sounding music entering that place of the sacred. I don't want that. And, I, and a lot of people my age and younger, I think, don't want that either. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, whereas I, I want the Holy Spirit to move powerfully, I want people to acknowledge his presence and to um, live as if, because he does, uh, he acts now, live as if he acts now. Um, what, what's the future? And again, feel free to disagree. Okay, yeah, yeah, I will push back on that a little bit. Yep. Um, well, first of all, um, I would say the most powerful experiences of Mass that I've had were really in, in uh, a couple of settings. One, right here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, especially when Father Michael Scanlon was president, and the liturgies were thoroughly charismatic. I don't remember if we had drums, but... Um, there was anointed preaching, but there was singing in tongues. There was um, the, the gifts of the Spirit being manifested, and it was heaven on earth. Um, and then an, another most powerful experience of the liturgy was the liturgies I've attended with Pope John, Pope Saint John Paul II <laughs> in Rome and other places. Um, and my own parish is a charismatic parish by its bylaws. It was established by the bishop to be a charismatic parish. And I would say that, you know, the, the drums are not a significant, I'm not a big fan of drums. Drums, at guitar, mass. piano, I don't like any of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But um, that is more peripheral. What, what makes the masses at my parish so wonderful is the atmosphere of of real worship. Brothers and sisters you who walk actually believe in there, the Lord, yeah. Yeah, they actually believe the Lord. You walk in there 
and you see a church full of people who are caught up in the Lord. And it was just a couple weeks ago I was at Mass there, and I was looking up on the altar after communion, and there's our, our pastor with his, his hands up worshiping the Lord like this, um, a couple of deacons, and then I saw one of the little altar boys, m- maybe 10 years old, caught up in God. His face lifted to heaven, his eyes closed, his hands up, he's singing with all his heart, just caught up in mm-hmm. God. And there's something about the, the simple love songs that have come out of the charismatic renewal that are usually very biblically based, mm-hmm. at least the good ones are, that um, enable people to, to, to bypass the, all of the, the, the verbal functions of the brain and just sing to the Lord a love song from the heart. And, and I think that's irreplaceable. And, and also, if you look in Scripture itself and the Psalms, which are the, the liturgy of Israel, how they teach us to worship the Lord, they say things like, with a loud shout, with lyre and harp and tambourine, with, with the sound of musical instruments, play to the Lord with all your skill, clap your hands, shout for joy. So, so God's own prayer book teaches us to worship him together mm-hmm. at public worship with the full human expression of emotion. Now, I'm, I, you know, I love uh, traditional masses as well. Uh, I mean, the Novus Ordo done in a traditional way with Gregorian chant and hymns. Um, that has its own kind of beauty. And this is but, what the church has taught us to do. That's the other thing. I think pe- people would push back and say, that's fine, and yet the church mm-hmm. has sought, seen to it that uh, you know, Sacrosanct and Concilium would say the Gregorian chant mm-hmm. ought to be given pride of place in the mm-hmm. liturgy. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. The, someone pushing back on you might say, well, did, mm-hmm. did the Second Vatican Council get it wrong? Well, I would say no. It's, it's certainly possible to do that too. In my parish, we do sing Gregorian chant for the Kyrie, and for the Sanctus and the Lamb of God very often. So, um, and, and in my parish, people know more melodies for the Kyrie than any other place I've ever seen. They know the, the chant, they know how to do it right. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's this beautiful mixing together of, of the old and the new. Okay. You know, tradition is not meant to be static. Mm-hmm. It's meant to be enculturated yeah. in every time and place. And, and I think since Vatican II, all the popes have recognized that the church, especially now, having become truly globalized and truly enculturated in every country of the world, needs to be open to the, the, the genius of the, the forms of music, you know, within certain limits, those that are fully compatible with the, the dignity of the liturgy, but to be fully open to traditions of, of worship that help people in their own culture enter into the presence of the Lord. But that's the question, though. Where are the limits? I mean, suppose you came across uh, a subset of people who found heavy metal really inspiring, <laughs> and it's a way to be passionate as uh-huh. they sing, and this uh-huh. is how we're going to choose to conduct our masses. Uh-huh. What's, is there any problem with that? Yes, th- there are appropriate limits that, um, that some documents of the church since Vatican II have established. Um, secular music that by its very nature um, arouses the sense appetites is not appropriate, okay. clearly. I know I'm liturgy. cutting you off, but I'm, I, mm-hmm. I want to push back here because um, heavy metal music with Christian lyrics, it may arouse the sense appetites, but so does love songs to Jesus in the way charismatic songs are usually sung. Um, They're very emotional. Yeah. Well, I, probably the, the better way to say it is the fleshly appetites or the, you know, our, our baser nature, um, you know, sensuality of a kind that is totally inappropriate to the liturgy. So heavy metal kind of music is designed to, to stir up that kind of sensuality. Um, mm-hmm. Even if it's not you know, overtly sexual, uh, there's something lowering about it that is inappropriate to the worship of God. But, yeah. but simply... I don't know if I agree. I, 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 I can agree. I, I can agree. You can continue. I, I cut you <laughs> off. Feel free to finish if you like. But... Well, uh, I was just going to say, you know, simply the use of, of guitars or um, pianos or other instruments in itself doesn't do that. Okay. Yeah. I'm, otherwise, the I'm church happy to would think say. More about it. Otherwise, the church would say, 
you absolutely may not do this. And the church doesn't say that. It says Gregorian chant has pride of place, but the church absolutely does not forbid other kinds of music in the liturgy. And and that has been affirmed by all of the popes no, I agree since Vatican with that. II. I agree with that. And something I keep saying is a faithful Catholic is not only one who submits to what the church teaches authoritatively, but is also one who does not demand uniformity, where the church yes. allows diversity of yes. opinion or custom. Right, right. But I, I, yeah, I just, I'm gonna have to think about this more because uh, I, I, st I still find it problematic. I find it, I find that this, the, 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 the kind of, as you say, love songs to Jesus are just sort of often secular sounding ripoffs or, and with, with love, lovey-dovey often lyrics imposed and some can be certainly more sophisticated than others and some I might even enjoy outside some of the Some are liturgy. cheesy. I, yeah. I can completely agree with that. Some are, ch are chintzy. Mm -hmm. But I think there are many that are biblically based. They may be simple. Um, I, I, I don't think they're, they're just takeoffs of secular songs. But they, um, they do draw on the musical sensibilities of our contemporary culture, which you know I freely admit are not sophisticated, <laughs> not elevated. Um, but they are what, um, what, what people are able to identify with. And, and even, you know, St. Say, say John of the Cross used contemporary love songs and, and turned them into poems mm. uh, expressing love for God. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the beauty of, of praise and worship music because I, I, I love it. Uh, I'll go through different seasons uh, where I'll listen to different things, but yeah, I love listening to Hillsong. I love listening to you know, different, different praise and worship songs. Um, and I, I, I do, I, I am, I, I want to push back against the criticism of those as well. I think there's been this sort of pendulum swing where maybe people have been disappointed with the laxy daisy way in which the liturgy has been celebrated or the way in which Catholics have maybe uh, too readily adopted Protestant prayers and teachings and things like that. And so there's this pendulum swing perhaps back to, well, we only listen to Gregorian chant. And I would, ne you know, I would never listen to that Protestant sort of thing. Like Protestant sort of thing. Sure, it's true that you can have sort of erroneous theology in certain praise and worship songs. But to, 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 to use, you know, as you say, contemporary music with which you feel familiar to praise the Lord, I'm not sure why this has to be or is, can possibly be a bad thing. Yeah. Are you, are you okay. experiencing that? Do you see people? Is it just me who pushes back on things like this? I mean, are you encountering people who are having that reaction? You mean your, the, the initial reaction you had or the one that you <coughs> are having now? Well, I, I, I'm, really try, I'm really trying to, I guess, get to the middle, right? So on one hand, I personally don't, if I walk into a church and I, I don't want to experience the secular in my liturgies, I want to go somewhere where I can, as it were, kiss the earth and experience the, 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 the beauty of the, the church's liturgy. And I think that, for example, Gregorian chant or polyphony is much more beautiful and therefore mm -hmm. more appropriate. Mm -hmm. In the same mm -hmm. way, a marble altar would be more appropriate than a card mm -hmm. table, mm -hmm. though you mm -hmm. could, I suppose, use a card table, but one's more dignified. That would mm -hmm. be my argument there. Mm -hmm. But here I think I'm agreeing with you and, and mm -hmm. wanting to kind mm -hmm. of press back against those mm -hmm. Catholics who would be dismissive yeah. of praise and worship mm -hmm. music because mm -hmm. it's emotional or something like that. Right, right. Um, I, maybe one way I would look at it is... Um, when you have a beautiful Mozart mass or, or Haydn mass, um, it's an aesthetic experience. You, you experience the incredible sophistication mm -hmm. and, and beauty of the music. But that's different from having a spiritual experience. That, that's different from having a heart-to-heart -heart connection with the Lord. Some people are more able to have a heart-to-heart -heart connection with the Lord through a Haydn Mass or a Gregorian chant Mass. Mm -hmm. And some people, um, seems to be the majority, are more able to have a heart-to-heart -heart connection with the Lord through the, the simple, the, the, the unsophisticated, the, the lowly, the less musically uh, well sure. done, well crafted. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, why would, would we want to suppress that and squelch mm. that if it's enabling people to have that heart-to-heart -heart connection with the Lord. I mean, just looking at the phenomenon of praise and worship, back when I was a student here at Steubenville, it was unknown, except here and a few other places and, you know, charismatic renewal conferences and things. Mm -hmm. But now it's completely mainstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, because, isn't it? 
Yes, be, you know, especially for young people, but really people of all ages, they they're 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 drawn to it because it gives that heart to heart connection with mm-hmm. the Lord, and and it's been great to see it become mainstreamed, because yeah. if, if people aren't having a heart to heart connection with the Lord and even an emotional um, connection, they're going to have an emotional connection somewhere else. And what our culture offers yeah. is and, not exactly going to be healthy and, and, what, and, what and spiritually s- upbuilding. Yes, and what we said earlier about, well, why would you think you sh- it wouldn't be emotional, right, to realize that the Lord loves you, right? Right. And and something similar, I think, um, people might say something of praise and worship music, that it's just, it's very emotional and um, I don't sure yeah, what they mean what's by wrong that, with that. But it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, what's the problem with that? It stirs up right. the emotions. Right. Yeah, right. fine, good. As, as you know, being a good Thomist, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that the emotions are subordinate to reason. Right. They are not to direct or lead reason. We shouldn't act irrationally based on emotion. However, the more fully involved the emotions are, or what he calls the passions, the more virtuous an act is. We are not angels. Mm-hmm. You know, we are not, you know, conscience who are, are meant to to do things out of pure Mm-hmm. Moral duty, yeah. a fully human act, like like saying, like say, serving the poor, yeah. or um, or caring for a member of your family, is more virtuous to the degree the emotions are involved, yeah. but in harmony with the reason. I just read um, Men Without Chests, that little lecture by C.S. Lewis. Mm. He talks about mm-hmm. how the heart is what kind of connects the mm. the brain with with the passions mm. as it were and kind of integrates them mm. um, and this is why mm. we have to have right feeling and i think mm. it was mm. uh, well plato or aristotle or both who talked about how education is like training you to love what you ought to love and hate what you ought to hate yes yeah. exactly very good yeah it's only in the modern era that we were suspicious of the emotions and of course in our culture what do we see emotions out of control isn't that interesting so on yeah. one hand we're very skeptical of, mm-hmm. of emotions, mm-hmm. um, and it all has to be uh, proven by science, or everything needs to be questioned. But on the mm-hmm. other hand, we're just mm-hmm. off the off the hook. We're all yeah, yeah. It we're is. In a frenzy. It is ironic. We're in an emotional frenzy, and and it, yeah. as I, I sometimes um, tell my students, in the in the football arena, emotions are allowed. You know, um, wild emotions, right? What do you do <laughs> yes. when there's a 50-yard touchdown pass? Yeah. You know, wild emotion is yes. acceptable and, and and encouraged even. Right. Or or say in the movie theater, you know, a Hallmark movie, you know, you start to hear sniffling yeah. around you and uh, people beginning to pull out their tissues. It's acceptable there. How is it that we think it's acceptable in, in those f- spheres mm-hmm. and not in the worship of God? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Especially for young people. You know, if we're telling them, you know, it's inappropriate for you to get emotional yeah. in the worship of God, what what are we encouraging them to do? Suppress their emotions and find an outlet elsewhere mm. instead of integrating their emotions into their life with God and the Christian life in general. Yeah, that's beautifully put. What you just said there I think makes a lot of sense. Hey, I want to talk about... Um, the day and age in which we live, which seems to be increasingly hostile towards the Christian. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to set this up by Mm -hmm. reading uh, Psalm 12. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just kind of get you to comment on it, if that's okay. Sure. Help me, Lord, for there is not one godly man left. For the faithful are minished from among the children of men. They talk of vanity, every one with his neighbor. They do but flatter with their lips and dissemble in their double heart. The Lord shall root out all deceitful lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things, which have said, with our tongue will we prevail. We are they that ought to speak. Who is Lord over us? Now for the comfortless troubles sake of the needy and because of the deep sighing of the poor, I will up, saith the Lord, and will help every one from him that swelleth against him and will set him at rest. The words of the Lord are pure words, even as the silver which from the earth is tried and purified seven times in the fire. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The ungodly walk on every side. When they are exalted, the children of men 
are put to rebuke. That's a powerful psalm. I read that this morning and I just thought the day and age in which we live. Yeah, we live in a a godless age. Isn't that amazing? You know, 2,500 or more years old, 3,000 years old, and it it speaks to our time right now. The line that really struck me as you read it just now is, who is Lord over us? Yes. Isn't yeah, we that are what the ones co- who shall speak, yes. is what it says too. Who's, who's going to tell us what human life is? Yes. We who's are g- they that ought to speak. Mm. Mm. Who's going to tell us what sex is about, what marriage is about? Who's Lord over us? It's, it's also like what it says in Psalm 2. Why did the nations rage and conspire against the Lord and against his anointed? And say, let us cast off his shackles from us. So it's, it's fallen humanity saying, I'll be my own God. I'll, I don't need any God telling me what to do. I don't need any God telling me what's right and what's wrong. Thanks, but no thanks, God. That's what our contemporary age is saying. And, and then a couple lines later, it, it spoke about the, the poor crying mm-hmm. out. and Deep and sighing. It, yeah, and it just makes me think of all the casualties of a culture of death. You know, the unborn, first and foremost, um, but today, increasingly, children who are sexualized at such an early age, robbed of their innocence, and then being taught and propagandized all kinds of profoundly false and confusing things about their identity, about what happiness is, about what love is. And, and, the, and their cries are going up to God, and God is hearing their cries, and, and he's not going to allow indefinitely what is going mm. on with its destruction of the, the poor and the, the weak and the young. How do we be courageous in a day and age like mm. this? And mm. um, why should we heed the advice of Gandalf, who, if you remember, <laughs> said to Frodo something to the effect of, uh, it's not mm. for us to ask such questions. All that we ought to decide is what to do with the time that's been given us. I love or, that yeah, line. He says something I, to the effect yeah. of, uh, you know, why, I wish the ring never came to me. You know, Yes, um, yeah. So, uh, why, did it, why did this happen? I wish I never lived in this time. And he said, uh, you know, all who live in such times ask these sorts of things. But Yeah, yeah. There's a similar line from Pope Pius the, I think it was the Pius XI, um, in the years leading up to World War II, when somebody said, um, you know, how unfortunate that we have to live in this time we're in right now. Yeah. He said, no, thank God that we live in this time because it is no longer permitted to be mediocre. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry if everyone can hear <laughs> the gigantic crashing. Can you hear that? Oh, yeah, yeah crash. There's, just so everybody knows, uh, work is being done on our building here in Steubenville, and gigantic metal things are falling off of it. So anyway, um, but that's anyway. beautiful. Yeah, I mean, how yeah, many yeah. of us are really just, in a sense, cursing the fact that we live in such an age? Yeah, this yeah, is awful, yeah. depraved culture, and we maybe be, we're nostalgic for another day as opposed right, to what you've said. Right. Praise you, Jesus. That yeah, you- yeah. And even more, I love the line from the book of Esther when... Um, this decree has just gone out to kill all the Jewish people, and here she is a queen in the royal court. Uh, it's probably unknown that she is a Jew, and um, so she's safe, but her people are not safe. And her uncle Mordecai says to her, you got to go and, and tell the king to, to stop this and save your people. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, 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 I can't, I can't do that. Anybody who goes to the king's presence without his permission is killed, so I can't do that. And he says, if you don't help your people now, Help will arise for the Jewish people from another quarter, quarter, but you yourself will perish. And who knows but that you have not come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Wow. You have come into the kingdom. Sometimes people um, paraphrase it as you were born. For, no, it's not born. It's come into the kingdom. We've come into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, for such a time as this. And God, who has chosen that, that you and I live in precisely the time and place we do, has done that for his purposes because each one of us, every single person, has an assignment from God that nobody else can fulfill for his plan of salvation unfolding in such a time as this. So we should never complain for having been born into and come into the kingdom at a difficult time. We should thank God for that Mm -hmm. because times of greater trouble require greater grace and greater anointing of the Holy Spirit, greater miracles, greater signs and wonders, greater help from God. And he is 
ready and willing to give it to whomever asks him for that in this time we're in. In your talk last night at Franciscan, you mentioned some examples of courage. Could you share mm. some of them? Sure. Um, one of them is a woman named Niole Sadunaite, who is Lithuanian, and she grew up in Lithuania in the period when they had been taken over by the Soviet Union uh, and just simply annexed into the Soviet Union. And uh, state atheism had been violently imposed on that deeply Catholic co country. And Neole, as a young woman, became involved in underground publishing of a national Catholic newspaper that gave tremendous courage to a lot of people around the country. But she was eventually caught and arrested and imprisoned by the KGB. And uh, when she was in prison, they, they could not figure out why she was always smiling. <laughs> this young woman who had just you know had her life taken away from her, basically, by being put into KGB prison, was smiling all the time. And uh, her story is, is told in, in a book called Radiance in the Gulag. It's out of print, but um, mm. if you can get it, it's just such an inspiring book. But um, during this one interrogation, the KGB agent um, assured her, as they often did, uh, you know, just give us the names of your collaborators and we're going to let you go home. Everything will be fine. Collaborators meaning what in this context? Other, other people who were working in uh, publishing this underground okay. secret yep. Catholic newspaper. So um, she actually gave this KGB agent who had her totally under his power she gave him a tongue lashing. And she said, if I were to give away the names of those I have worked with and cause them harm, it would be a living hell for me. Mm. But I will live at peace even if you put me in a psychiatric institution. And you know, you know what that meant in the, in the Soviet Union. Even if you put me in a psychiatric institution for the rest of my life, I will live it with a smile on my face knowing that I haven't caused harm to anybody else. But how can you, who have shed so much blood, go to bed with a, uh, with the conscience that you have? I would rather die a thousand deaths mm. than walk around with the conscience you have. And this you know, experienced, seasoned KGB agent turned pale and hung his head. Now, it, you know, as the story turned out, Neole was condemned and sentenced to exile in Siberia and you know that was not a not a nice punishment and she spent years in Siberia and when the Iron Curtain fell she was allowed to come back to her country and not long after that she actually came here to Steubenville and that's she one of my spent that's a year my favorite in Steubenville. Part of the story. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like wow you're a flesh and blood person you know yes, you're not actually. Yes, flesh and blood <laughs> yeah and I was so privileged to get to know her she she lived with wow. my parents for that year and wow. and she's she's still going now I saw her in Lithuania a couple of years ago and wow. she's a national hero. Mm. And then, of course, we have that man at the bakery shop in, uh, where was that, Colorado? Who was, uh, was it Yes, Colorado? yes, Colorado. Yeah. yeah, Jack Phillips. And he's being, mm. what, sued He's right on his now? third lawsuit um, because he, he will not make a cake with a message that he cannot endorse yeah. in conscience. He doesn't refuse service to anybody. He treats his customers with respect. He's a godly Christian man. I... I I have talked with a lawyer who's one of the lawyers who has helped him. Um, but, you know, they're out to get him, you know. Uh, th they will target, the, the ideologues on the left will target those who stand firm in, in, in the truth of the gospel mm. and make, uh, attempt to make their life miserable. So um, our, our shameful deeds are not content with being tolerated. Yeah, right. They have right. to be celebrated. Right. And so it's yeah. not enough. You you must. It's not enough to tolerate. You yeah. must uh, parrot secular dogma. Right. Right. So the left preaches tolerance until they get the power, and then they don't talk about tolerance anymore. Or they may talk about it, but they don't practice it. Mm. Yeah, it is interesting in a day and age where we say God doesn't exist, and therefore I suppose it would naturally follow that there's no sort of universal moral precepts and obligations since who would there be to issue them? And yet we are so moralistic today. Yes, isn't that true? Yeah. 
Well, look, this has just been a, lo a lovely pleasure. It's lovely to sit down with you Thank to you. meet you. Thank it's you for all the. It's been great getting to know you too. Good, yeah. Where can people learn more about you and maybe some of your books or, or commentaries that you've put together? The easiest way is my website, drmaryhealy.com, drmaryhealy.com. And all my books are listed there. I have a few talks that are uh, available on, for download or on CDs. And then I have a lot of talks that people have put on the, on YouTube that yeah. I haven't put there, but yeah. people have put there. So Terrific. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Great. God bless you. That's the... Oh, 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 oh,